Nathan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Good to be here. Great. Yeah, it was good running into you a few weeks ago at MDNM Minnesota, mm -hmm. and we got a chance to sit down and uh, talk about Hemasense. And uh, I wish that I hit the record button at that time, but uh, we're here. We are. We'll do it again. We'll run it again, right? Absolutely. O always happy to chat about it. Excellent. Yeah. So it's very exciting. I know you had over the last couple of years a big transition in your career and. Uh, you didn't rest on your laurels at all. You came back and <laughs> part of a startup and raising yeah. money, developing technology. Tell us a little bit about Hemasense and the unmet need that you're uh, working on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, maybe I'll, I'll frame it in kind of a little bit of the story on how this idea came about, um, which I think gives a little context to folks. So, you know, my background has always been in uh, product development and trying to understand unmet needs in the medical space and connect those through to technologies. I did that for a very long time at Gore and kind of how Hemasense came about is exactly that model. So two of my co-founders, uh, Ben Trapp and Cody Hartman actually sat down with a cardiologist uh, that we've known for a while, Anita Asgar uh, out of Montreal Heart. And they presented a pretty simple question to her. They said, what are the patients that you don't, that you worry about that you don't have a treatment for? And maybe more specifically, what keeps you up at night? Um, because those are the kinds of problems we want to be working on. And I, I think, you know, Ben likes to say they had their pencils sharpened and they had the next heart valve technology written down on their paper already. And she kind of surprised them a little bit and said, you know what, the heart valve technologies are incredible these days. There's a lot of new ones coming to the market, but what really keeps me awake at night, quite literally, are access site complications. Mm -hmm. This has been, I think, something that has been around and in the industry since we started doing these catheter based procedures is that access site complications can kind of be this almost black cloud over a procedure because when a patient has one you don't you don't know it's going to happen in a lot of cases and it can really you know throw a wrench in the recovery process from these procedures that really are supposed to be much less invasive and a much quicker recovery than their previous you know, surgical intervention counterparts. And so she said, these bleeding complications, especially in the large diameter uh, procedures is really what, what is a problem that I don't have a solution for. So we kind of took that away. And, and that's when I started getting involved is actually after they had this initial idea, we said, okay, you know, how big a problem is this? And what can we do about it? And what we came to realize is, you know, A, it's a big problem. This still happens in about 5% of the large diameter catheter patients out there. They have an access site bleeding complication. But B, what's really intriguing about this problem is if you can catch this very, very early, then it's a pretty simple intervention. It can be something like direct pressure on the access site, um, because you can imagine these bleeds are actually happening at the vessel, so they're mm -hmm. below the surface of the skin. Yeah. And so they're not seen until they're very large, where you get really large bruising or you get a hematoma that's formed. And so we realized if we can detect this early, we can actually get these patients out of the hospital quicker, get them back to their daily lives and put them in a position where they're not a burden on both their daily lives, but also the healthcare system. So what Hemasense is, is we've come up with um, this technology. It's based around bioimpedance, uh, which has been around for a very long time. And we can detect very small amounts of blood down at the vessel level below the access site. And we can do that with just a patch form factor. So it's a patch with a series of electrodes on it. And we put very small amounts of current into the tissue. And then we interrogate the resistance of that tissue to see if highly conductive blood has started to accumulate below the surface. Um, so that's really what the product is. It's an early detection mechanism for access site bleeding so that we can alert these healthcare providers, the nurses, the doctors, that something is wrong here and you need to come and do something about it before they would ever be able to see it or feel it if they were you know, going in and manually kind of palpating the site, which is how they're trying to detect them today. You mentioned the large bore access. It, it, is it safe to say that it's uh, the propensity of internal bleeding is more prevalent on large bore access, uh, procedures than kind of small bore? Yeah, it definitely is. I mean, I think the 
the general numbers that you kind of see is large bore is in that kind of five, six, seven percent range, depending mm -hmm. on which you know most recent paper you look at. Small bore is probably closer to like two or three percent range. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, much much larger market. There's a lot more small bore procedures, but because of the diameter, um, that bleeding complication rate is lower in small bore. That being said, um, it is still a problem there. And small bore procedures uh, in general are more likely to be outpatient procedures. And so if there's a bleeding complication that doesn't get caught there, those patients can be coming back. And that's, that's a huge problem. Um, whereas large bore is inpatient, and so they're staying in the hospital. So it's really prolonging an existing hospital stay in large bore versus small bore where there may be a readmission at some point if they have a complication. I was looking at um, some of the sort of predicate devices, I, I suppose, um, vascular closure devices, and even the, uh, you know, the resorbable collagen-based patch. Besides that, I suspect, I, I saw that the range of complications still, even with the closure devices, is two to, you know, 9%. Uh, and you said five. So, I mean, that's, that's compelling. Yeah. And, it, yeah. you know, it's interesting because I've actually been keeping an eye, you know, working at Gore, we had a, we had a, a huge number of devices that fall into this large bore category. And so I've been kind of keeping an eye on these complications because it's something that, you know, has always been around. And if you look back 10 years, when there was really just the per close device that people were using for these, mm -hmm. or they were doing open cut downs, I mean, the, the bleeding complication rate was actually like as high as 18%. Mm -hmm. So it has come down a lot. And I think because of physicians getting more familiar with these devices and also some of these new devices that have come on the market, that rates come down, but it's really, it's leveled out at that like five, you know, to 8% range that, that you just said. And when you talk to these physicians, they say, you know, you got to keep in mind, these are sick patients. They have cardiovascular disease. They have calcification. You know, a lot of them have like, you know, clotting disorders or something like that. And so they're pretty skeptical across the board that you're really going to get much lower than 5% mm -hmm. just because there's, there's so many variations in these patients and they're, they're not the healthiest patients in the world. Um, that that's kind of probably where we're going to settle out at mm -hmm. and the closure devices are very good, but it's just the reality of this population. Um, right. and, and our device works with all of those different closure devices. We, it's not an either or. And so I think that puts us in a really good position where we can say, Hey, we can help, even, you know, even though you guys are getting really good rates with this, a lot of your patients are leaving early. There's even a push to go to same day discharge on some of these patients. And we may be able to help enable that. Yeah. Okay. Um, kind of on the, all on the same lines on predicate devices. I know there's a, a device called the early bird. And I believe that's uh, through a sheath, not, you know, a patch. Can you talk a little bit about just high level comparisons? Yeah. Yeah, so um, the early bird is a, a sheath device, like you said, is made by a company called Serenus. Um, I think it's how you, you pronounce it. Um, they were actually using a similar technology, also using bioimpedance, but they're doing it on a sheath. So hmm. they put the access sheath in, you go and do the procedure, and it has a series of electrodes on the sheath that can monitor for bleeding coming out, excuse me, during the procedure. But I think what we've found is that can be somewhat valuable so that if you're seeing you know a drop in blood pressure during the procedure or something you can kind of check that and see okay are you getting bleeding outside of the vessel during the procedure but the reality is where these complications are really a problem is after you pull the sheath out mm -hmm. so yeah. again similar technology i think there's a lot of value we're looking at at kind of how they did their testing and you know what they were presenting to the fda to get approval because they are an approved device um, to kind of give us some idea of how to go about this. But I think the timing of what they were targeting is not exactly solving the right problem there. Um, okay. And so that's that's where we come in is we're after they've pulled that sheath out when the patient is on the way to the recovery room, that's when they'll apply our patch and you know take them to recovery and, and okay. monitor at that point. And the 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 hemosense patch is the sutureless device, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So our patch is not meant to actually close anything it goes mm -hmm. on the skin and actually if you um you know if you kind of imagine these sheaths go in at a 45 degree angle yeah and so if your skin incision is up here your vessel punctures here you actually want the patch to sit over top of that track because that's where you want to monitor and so we don't actually even cover up the skin incision itself 
and we've talked about actually putting a you know something like a notch in our patch or something like that to help with positioning because we know the direction that sheath went in we know it's going in generally at a 45 degree angle and so we're not trying to be a bandage or close anything up we're simply a, a monitoring device that goes over that area right interesting you know uh, as a ceo of a startup um I think one of your primary roles is funding, right? <laughs> Getting funding, <laughs> raising money, uh, different series or, or different rounds. Can you tell us a little bit uh, how you've gone through that process and any future rounds that you're uh, anticipating? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of the, the primary roles of the CEO is make sure we can keep the lights on. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, we're we're in the middle of raising um, our first actual round of funding right now. Uh, we've self-funded all of the technology development up to this point. So we've done our proof of concept. Um, you know, you can imagine we're doing this in a in a way where we're doing benchtop models at this point. We're we're proving out the fundamental technology, and we've done that. Um, we've shown that we can actually detect this bleed event in a relevant kind of benchtop model. Um, so now we're raising a round of funding. It's a pre-seed round. Um, it's a, a non-priced round. So we're, we're selling um, safe notes at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and that the goal of this initial round is to get us through to a proof of concept on an animal study um, with our, you know, as close to final form factor on the patch itself that, that we can. And then we're likely to still have a tethered kind of approach for this um, next round. So we're doing a lot of work on the skin interface because we know that's a big uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And then we really just need to get some data in an actual animal to, to show what that looks like and start gathering that data and building that up so that we can develop the algorithms we need to actually not put out false alarms and stuff like that. Um, so that that Funding round is open right now. Um, it's, you know, an angel investment round. Um, you know, it, you know, obviously if somebody institutional investor came in and wanted to take a piece of that, we'd be happy to chat with them. Mm -hmm. um, but the goal is to get us through that product development phase, get to, you know, pretty close to a, a design specification for what our final device will look like. And at that point, we'll likely raise our first um, actual price round. And that'll be a much bigger round with the goal of getting us through to FDA approval at that point. Okay. The, the pre-seed uh, round, is that a, you mentioned angel, is it targeted is it angel investors? Is it, is it open? Are you talking to whoever might be interested, <laughs> yeah. so to speak? Yeah, we're absolutely, um, you know, talking to anybody who might be interested. Um, uh, just to be very honest, we've had a lot of good interest from folks who are in this um, kind of area, you know, physicians, sales associates, mm -hmm. you know, people who have been around the cardiovascular space, because I think what, what's what been really encouraging is everybody we talked to has said, man, I, I wish I had this device today. Mm -hmm. um, because it's something that, especially from the nurses um, side of the whole equation, they're dealing with this, you know, on a weekly basis yeah. and sometimes a daily basis in these high volume institutions. Yeah. And so we've seen some interest um, with getting involved in this funding round from kind of those type of people. Um, but as, as every startup is in these early phases, it's, you know, some friends and family as well. Um, people who, who know what we've been capable of doing as a team, um, both myself and Ben Trapp, our CTO, um, we've worked together for over 20 years together in the medical device development space. And so we, we know this world, we know what it takes to get a device mm -hmm. to market. Um, and I think that's been really valuable because we're not coming into this blind. We know what we're yeah. going to need to do down the road to, get an FDA approval and all those kinds of things. Okay. Wow. Very exciting, Nathan. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. It's, it's been a really exciting journey so far and, and it's only getting better by the day. I think we're, we're very, very excited to push this across the line and, and get to that next milestone so that we can start building up the team and actually moving into design control and, and moving towards an FDA approval um, so that we can get in the clinic as quick as we can. Yeah. It's, it, it's a, it's a really valuable product. It's going to, I think, change a lot of people's lives in a, in a positive way, both from a patient as well as a healthcare provider perspective. Yeah. So for, you know, over 20, 25 years or more, we focused on minimally invasive procedures, technologies, catheter-based technologies, less trauma, less time in the hospital. And there's so much more work to do, right, uh, mm -hmm. in that area. And you're doing that. So uh, that's really exciting. I wish you guys the best of luck with the yeah. seed rounds and all these different phases that you're going through. 
And yeah. uh, how do people get in touch with you if they're interested in learning more or investing? Yeah, so um, we have a website up, hemasense.com. Um, but if people want to get a hold of me directly, it's just Nathan at hemasense.com. And it's H E M A H E M A S E N S E is hemasense. Um, and yeah, be, be happy to chat with people. Um, even if you're not interested in investing, you want to learn more about it, or you have some insights or some resources that you think would be valuable to us at this phase, I'm, I'm all ears. You know, it, it takes a, it takes um, a community to kind of build these devices and, and these products. And so, um, we're, we're looking for any, any kind of partner who's interested, um, whether it's development, clinical, whatever that looks like. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks again, Nathan. This has been great. And uh, again, wish you all the best of luck uh, as you move through the different phases of this product. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to chat with you and, and kind of share our story and where we're at. And we'll look forward to interacting in the future as we keep our, our development rolling. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks again. Uh -huh.